You're home, everybody's home. This is good. You can relax before next week. Ooh, it's a highly high stress week next week. Everybody's up, everybody's up. Boom, 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 boom. And number two. Who is this? I don't recognize this space. Am I supposed to be here? Huh. There's no name. Okay. Everybody's up. This is the grand finale of this semester. And we are done. By your webcam, Karen. Karen, I thought I saw Karen. Oh no, that was Gigi, sorry. Same thing. Karen, Gigi. You're good, Karen. I saw Gigi, so I'm, it's the same difference. All right, grand finale, we're going to talk about immunosuppressants, alternative and complementary therapies, and vaccines. My webcam's not working. Let's start with anybody else? Ta -ta -ta. Nobody's, everybody's up. Nobody else. All right, let's go. Immunosuppressants. These medicines are given to suppress the immune system. Question is, why the hell, why, why do we want to suppress the immune systems? It's supposed to protect us from anything, everything, and all of that stuff. Why do I want to suppress it? Because sometimes when it tries to attack the um, external factor that's messing with our body, this happens. His immune, Will Smith's immune system is going full speed ahead. And eventually from this point on, if it keeps going, it's gonna start closing down his airways. This is one example of um, where we can, when we can use the um, immunosuppressive drugs. And here's a couple more. Love that movie, by the way. Autoimmune diseases, celiac disease, triggered by gluten ingestion. I'm sure there's a few of us, a few, not me, but a few of you guys um, may have this condition. Crohn's disease, another GI inflammation. Graves, talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Too much thyroid in the system. Gillian barre uh, myasthenia gravis, two neuro issues that affects the respiratory systems as a side effect, bad deal. Uh, lupus, this one attacks the skins, the joints, and the kidneys. Seen a handful of um, patients on dialysis because of, kidney, uh, because of lupus. And they start young, which is sucky part for these people. Another reason we give um, immunosuppressive drugs is for um, transplant patients. So the body does not reject the organ. This is a 30, 40 year old patient who received a lung transplant because of COVID. I think he's in California. The thing is he needs to be on this uh, medication for the rest of his life. So his body does not reject the, the lungs that are in his um, chest. With this medication, we're telling the WBCs to simmer down from attacking our own organs. It does work. So the body start, stop, stops attacking itself from any of those diseases I said earlier. But one of the uh, side effect of this of it, major side effect of it, is it suppresses bone marrow. Here's a little review of what bone marrow suppression does. Remember from a few weeks ago, low RBC, low CBCs, low platelets, and low WBCs, meaning I, have a, I don't have any immunity. If I get a cold, I may die from it. If I'm if I cut myself, I might. Um, let's see, I'm, that's exaggerating a little bit, but I have a high chance of bleeding because of this medication. So one medication 
The first medication I'm going to talk about is a famous medication from last year. It was all over the news. Not really what it was uh, supposed to, but remember this? Hydroxychloroquine. It was a hot topic last year when COVID first hit us. We were using it. I guess we didn't know any better. Somebody said, some guy in a basement somewhere said, hydrochloroquine can work well with COVID patients. We did, we tried them and um, we found out it didn't work. It didn't do anything. The only thing it did was lower the supplies for these guys, for the patients with malaria. It's what it's indicated for and lupus. It helps decrease inflammation and it helps decrease fatigue. So with these patients, the malaria patients, the lupus patients, when they start taking this, it takes a couple of months, uh, several months before it starts working. And when it starts working, they start feeling better. They start feeling energized because of this medication. So it does work only for these malaria and lupus not COVID. There's some side effects though with this medication, which we really didn't know much about this side effect. I'm whispering because we didn't know this when we were dealing with it, using it for our COVID patients last year, that they may have some eye issues, um, retinal damage, vision problems. So if you're on this medication, if a patient is on this medication, they need to see uh, an optometrist six, every six to six to 12 months, a minimum of once a year. Another thing is these patients, they don't need the medical alert bracelet or vitamin D or any other supplements or the carrot thing to get your eyesight, to improve your eyesight. No need for that. That's fairly straightforward. Next drug we're gonna talk about is the methotrexate. Indications for this, it's up there. Rheumatoid arthritis. It's when the body is attacking its own joints. Psoriasis, the body is attacking its own skin and certain types of cancers. It slows certain types of cancers. Uh, last week, maybe a couple of weeks ago, we were talking to one of the nurses on, uh, at one of the hospitals. And he said, I'm on this, I'm on this medication. And I think it makes him nauseated. He takes it every other day. He, he has a regimen and I think he's been on it for, for a while, if I remember. How does it work? It stops folic metabolism, which stops cellular reproduction in the fastest replicating cells. Let me grab it. Okay. To, to summarize, it basically suppresses the WBCs. So where are these fastest replicating cells? There's three of them in the blood immune system and also in the, in the fetus. Blood immune system and fetus. So when I talk about adverse effect of these medications, it is tied into these three. It leads to weak immune system, bleeding, and fetal death. On that note, contraindication for this medication is no babies, pregnant, no pregnant women. So if you're thinking of uh, having a baby while on this medication, no, 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 not yet. You have to use birth control because of this fetal death deal. Don't wait until the treatment is done. Okay. Other contraindications for this medication, no live vaccines. I'm gonna talk about the difference between live vaccines, uh, dead vaccine, inactivated vaccines in a few minutes. No razors because they're high risk for bleeding and also no hard brushing of teeth. Contraindications for that. Remember the difference. Oh, with this medication, this one is not toxic to the eyes. So we do not need to see the optometrist every year for, the, for, these, um, for patients on these medications. 
And that is the main difference between hydrochloroquine and methotrexate. Hydrochloroquine, eye issues. Methotrexate, pregnant issues. No babies. Hey, Alex, can I ask a quick question? No. For the no razors that it said, do we just not recommend them shaving at all or do we use the electronic razors? You can use electronic razors as long as it's less um, chances for cutting. Okay, Here's thank you. I, I've cut myself with electric razors before, so maybe it was an operator error. Um, nursing considerations to know with these medications. Watch for infection. If a patient has a fever more than 100.3 Fahrenheit or 38 centigrade, that means they may have an infection, early signs of infection. Keep in mind, these patients are, are their immune system is way, way low. So when they get to this stage with the low, um, with the low temperature, mild grade fever, they have something cooking already. And we need to address that. They also need to avoid crowds, sick people, because their immune system is low. These patients are going to be on um, uh, neutropenic isolations in the hospital, which means no fresh fruits or flowers, because bugs and bacteria from these um, things can get to my patient, which can make them sicker. What else? Watch for bleeding under 50 a platelet very risky. So report bleeding. If you see some Pitachi, Melano, uh, hemoptysis, bleeding in the, in, in the skin, in GI tract, coughing up blood, any signs of bleeding, it needs to be reported and addressed. Red flag, big red flag. And as I mentioned earlier, no live vaccines. Like these are, these are inactivated vaccines or dead vaccines, flu, pneumonia, meaning the germ we're introducing the patient, the flu germ is dead, pneumonia germ is dead, as opposed to these vaccines, live vaccines, MMR, smallpox, chickenpox, yellow fever, means the vaccine, I mean, the germ is alive, but it's in its very, very weakened state. So you're not going to get your low chance of getting sick from it. Another type of the third type of immunosuppressants is the TNF, two more necrosis factor inhibitors. Here's three examples Etanercept, Infliximab, Adalimunab. I don't know these medications as well. We don't see these in my world. Um, I think I see commercials for Humira every now and then, but it's one of the, one of the uh, immunosuppressive drugs. So what do you need to know about these, uh, the TNFs? It's that fever thing again. It's a big deal because if they have a low grade fever of 100.3 or 38, that means infection, infection, infection big deal for these patients. Bleeding, infections, and they're supposed to take it. They need to take it at the same time every day. There's something special about this drug though, the TNF, that is different from the other um, autoimmune, I mean, uh, immunosuppressive drugs. This is my friend, Jackie. One thing that's common with me and my friend Jackie, and I want to see about half of the population here in our uh, cohort is um, most Asians from Asia, we have a positive TB test. It does not mean we have tuberculosis. It means that we have the uh, TB, TB gene or the TB juice, let's call it juice, in our system. Because when we were kids, we received the BCG vaccine, vaccines. So we may or may not have a latent TB in our system, which means it's there, but it's dead. It's just there. Um, so this medication though, it can activate, it can activate, activate this, uh, 
this bacteria in our body and turn it into a full live tuberculosis. So keep in mind, we need a negative TB test before starting this medication. If um, they're positive for tuberculosis, they need to get treated first, which is a very long time, uh, months for a, a treatment to um, go on. Follow up TB testing, because we don't know if it's uh, when or if it reactivates the TB, TB in the syst patient's system. Oops, so uh, follow up with TB testing. So you guys, when you do your clinical paperwork, you write down CBC, chemistry, and all the lab parts. One thing to remember with this medication, with these patients that are immunosuppressed, is that their C-reactive protein, CRP, are going to be elevated because of their, immun their immunity is, um, is very low. So, um, so in these cases, elevated WBC for these patients is a red flag. It is common to see an elevated CRP for these patients, C-reactive protein. So for testing purposes, I have a patient with a lab that's elevated WBC, elevated CRP, or elevated cardiac enzymes, liver enzymes, all that renal panel stuff. I'm not really worried much about the renal panel. Okay, so they might be going to renal failure, but I'm not concerned about that yet. I am mainly concerned. My number one concern is that WBC. Because if my patient gets an infection, I need to address it right away, or my renal failure is going to be a non-issue if they're dead. So keep that in mind, WBC is a number one priority. Next, cyclosporin. This is a medication to prevent transplant rejection. This is my COVID guy who received a lung transplant and it's lifelong. So if a patient says, I'm excited, I've been taking the cyclosporin for 10 years now, my lung transplant 10 years ago was successful, I'm good, I'm done with this medication. That's a big red flag, meaning the patient does not understand this medication. So come back and let's do some more patient education. Let's talk about you having to take this medicine forever and ever, or you're gonna have issues with your 10 year old lung. Contraindications, about the same, pregnant women, uh, no live vaccines, razor, pretty much generic for all immunosuppressive drugs. One side effect of this though, um, the cyclosporin is this, gingiv gingival hyperplasia. That's when the gums start taking over, covering the teeth. One thing to know though is these things are chronic side effects. It doesn't happen. You don't wake up one morning and, oh, look at my mouth, that's nasty. Nope, it happens over time. So they need to see their dentist every six to 12 months for this. So there's no need, if you see this in a patient in a hospital, um, no need to call the physician stat and have this addressed. We're not gonna do anything for them in a the hospital anyway. We don't have dentists in a hospital. What do we need to know about this medicine? Same, fever, bleeding, infections, take the same day. Watch this, no grape juice for this medicine. No grape juice, because it alters the, um, it may increase the levels in the blood. Okay. There's also a handful of other medications where grape juice is contraindicated, and this is one of them, cyclosporin. The last immunosuppressant is the one you don't even think it's an immunosuppressant, but it is. It's big. It's major. It's, uh, it's this thing right here, epinephrine, the EpiPen. It's a vasopressor or epinephrine. It stimulates alpha beta receptors causing vasoconstriction. 
We use it for cardiac arrest, but we're not talking about cardiac arrest here. We're not talking about cardiac. We're talking about these people. Anaphylactic reaction to anything from shrimp to, I don't know, coffee, anything. If you're allergic to something, you have an anaphylactic reaction, you need this. This is going to save your life. And a side note, this pisses me off every time why it's 600 bucks here in the US and it's 69 bucks somewhere else or even free in other countries. That's my rant for the day. So, EpiPen. I have a quick question. Sorry for interrupting. You're not. Um, in terms of grape juice, did you mean grapefruit juice? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Just making sure. Yes. Because uh, we covered that in the farm one. There's like a couple of medications that don't go along with the grapefruit juice because of some kind of enzyme they have. Mm -hmm. So it's grapefruit, right? Grapefruit juice, grape juice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Potato, potato. Okay. Potato, potato. <laughs> Vodka, tequila. Same difference. I know it's not. You're going to tell me it's not. I'm just messing with you. So with this EpiPen, for severe anaphylactic reaction, first drug, drug of choice for anaphylactic reaction, it comes in auto injector. If you are allergic to anything, you should have this in your purse or man purse. It is going to save your life. It comes in a pack of two and you get it from pharmacy. And it's an, it's an auto injector. Where's my thing? And um, yeah, this is it. This is a lifesaver drug. Because for somebody who's having an anaphylactic reaction, it can lead, they go to hypotension and bronchoconstriction really quickly from whatever the, the foreign agent is. And that can lead to cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest. So you need this. If it's in your car, please get it out of your car, put it in your purse, your man purse, somewhere that's, it's on you. First signs of anaphylactic reactions, hives. Actually, I made a mistake. It's not hives. It's this one. You start, your breathing starts going. <gasps> Oh, shoot, something's wrong. Something is wrong. You start getting the hives. Your blood pressure starts dropping. Something is wrong. So the question is, how do you know if I should give this medicine or not? Should I give it? I'm not sure. You're, sh you're short of breath, but not that bad. I see some hives, but not that bad yet. You're getting a little dizzy, but it's not that bad. Do I give this to you? Do I give this? Do I give this? I don't know. ABC is your decision point, decision tree, airway, breathing, circulation. But if my airway is still okay, then it's a tough call. So if you don't know if you should give it or not, the answer is always just do it. It's not wrong to, to just do it. We would rather you give it than not. So what is the dose? You did it. It worked. Good. Thank you. Have a good day. So now you did it. You did it. And five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, my patient, your friend is still, <gasps> oh, it, it didn't work. It didn't work. Something's wrong. It's not working. It's not working. Two, two sides of the storylines here. One storyline is if you're in my hospital setting, if you're in an EMS truck, after this is administered to you, we're also gonna give you stuff. Stuff includes Benadryl, albuterol treatment, some steroids. These all work whoosh, to get the swelling down, to take your, um, the, your allergic reaction, um, symptoms down quickly. But 
in testing world, for my testing purposes, for NCLEX testing purposes, for ATI testing purposes, you have unlimited epi pin in your purse or man purse back pocket backpack wherever whatever you have so the dose for this one shot to the time is repeat q5 to 15 minutes until symptoms resolve you have unlimited for testing that is one issue um so when you're taking these um these tests try not to add something to the storyline which is a mistake uh, what some of you make, because I could be, the test question might say, oh, I have a, an EpiPen allergic reaction. I give myself a dose and then it's not working. What should I do next? Now you're thinking, and that's the end of the question. And now you're thinking, I'm sure he doesn't have any more because he's at Walmart shopping and his purse is very tiny it can only fit one, so it's, I, I can't give him another one because there's nothing there. He doesn't have any more. So don't add any more to it. Just give it, give it, give it. Steps, stab thigh, and then hold it there for 10 seconds. Some of you may have done it yourself or to another person. Make sure you hold it there for 10 seconds to make sure all the medications get into the patient. And like I said earlier, if you're in the hospital setting, we're gonna give you other stuff to control your, um, your symptoms, especially the airway swelling. We don't care much if you have hives, we have whatever other symptoms you have, you're itchy. It's this airway thing that's very important to us, especially now the ventilators are at a premium. Oh, if you're, if you are um, storing this in your car, it's not going to do you any good. Keep it to yourself, around you. So I'm done with uh, immunosuppressive medications. Next, let's talk about marijuana. Most of you probably do not know who these people are. When I grew up, they, these are two are like the godfather of of marijuana, Cheech and Chong. You can Google them. Um, so we're going to talk about alternative and complementary treatment. And in some cases, they are the main uh, treatment for pain, headache. Oh, we'll get to that. History. It's been used in China for these um, um, for menstrual disorders, gout, rheumatism, malaria, constipation. It's been used in India, what, 2000 years ago? Epilepsy, inflammation, pain. Western medicine, we started using it in the 1800s. Where's that? Epilepsy is there, muscle spasms. And it was listed in the uh, dispensary in 1854. Queen Victoria used it for, to control her uh, menstrual cramps in the 1800s. Chemi the chemical content of cannabis. It says there's a lot, but we're only gonna talk about two. We have the THC, which is your uh, psychoactive part of um, the cannabis. And you also, now you end, you have the um, CBD, which has the, um, uh, the, the medicinal part of the, uh, the cannabis. It does not have any uh, psychoactive effects. So if you're looking to get high, have a good time, CBD is not your answer. You're going with the THC. A little bit of difference, marijuana on the right, it has the bud. I believe that's where the THC is from. It's from the buds, gets you high, gets you feeling good. There's different strands. There's strands that will get you relaxed. I can play video games on the couch here all day with this, munching on Cheetos. Or there's strands that I can go out there, run a marathon because it gives me energy. On the flip side, on the hemp side, the CBD, it has a lot of um, uh, medicinal effects, therapeutic effects that we're going to talk about. And it will not get you high. 
What's the differences? Eh, I've talked about it already. The THC, high THC, low CBD. So with the THC part, it does not have any, uh, uh, or has low therapeutic effects. That's the main difference. And you don't need to know all that. Inhaled marijuana um, affects rapidly between 15 to 30 minutes. I may have um, researched this many, many years ago, but I'm sure it's less than 15 to 30 minutes. And it lasts up to four hours, sometimes longer. Ingested marijuana, the gummy bears, the chocolate. Uh, I was talking about earlier, I we'll have you know, one student, I'm not gonna name, she takes uh, 25 milligrams of, of THC to help her go to sleep at night. And she said, she this is better for her instead of taking uh, Ambien. And it's wor it works. But I reminded her that she has to pee in a cup after about two months after graduation. So, uh, oh, we'll get to that drug test earlier. Why are you nervous about this drug test? We'll get to that. So with the ingested marijuana, it, it starts acting and it starts taking effect within 30 minutes to three hours, but it lasts in the system longer. Um, down here, it says naive users. Um, it's, you can start from five to 20 milligrams of ingested THC. Since I don't know the dosage of it, I asked the, this person, the 25 milligrams that she takes, it's, uh, it's a little on the high end. So if I'm to take this, I'll probably start with a five to 10, maybe 10 milligrams. Next. Yeah. Yeah. So THC is legal in the US. Did you know that? It's legal for recreational drugs. It's legal for medic medicinal purposes. And it's also legal. It's been legal for many, many, for a couple of decades now. What am I talking about? This drug right here, Marinol, Dranabinol. It's THC in a pill form. I remember giving these to, uh, I believe, cancer patients from, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. Oh, shoot, I just dated myself. Patients coming to ER have brought in 50 milligrams. Oh, gummies, they do not recommend. Oh, yeah. Did you confiscate the gummies? And you should have. But uh, so Marinol, it's a pill THC. And we give it to uh, these patients, nausea, vomiting, MS, appetite stimulant. Uh, an example I gave you, this was a cancer patient. I think we wanted this patient to eat or something. Another one is sesame, nausea, vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Cautions with a THC. What do we need to do? Ingestion by children. You know why? Because if I have some gummies THC or chocolate THC, I'm not gonna leave it laying around here. And which is what happens. People leave it here and my 11 year old is gonna come out and, oh, gummy bears. All right, thanks dad. And not a good ER trip. Um, and from the manufacturer's point of view, this is how they, um, these are the, examples of wrappers of these uh, edibles. This looks like a generic Skittles to me. Generic candy, generic, uh, I don't know, gummies to me. So I, 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 if I'm a kid, I can easily grab this without paying attention. I'm not even gonna look at the wrapper. It looks cool. I'm gonna eat it. So this is when, where uh, a lot of the accidents happen from home. A little boy at my kid's school, oh, did the little boy know it was THC marijuana gummies or just thought it was generic gummies? No, they both ended up, yeah, of course. It's, see, this, is, this happens. It, 
happens. Another um, one time we have a, had a patient told this story earlier. We had a patient in the uh, in our ICU at Spring Valley. This person is from out of town coming to Vegas. I don't know, Mississippi, Texas, not Texas, somewhere where they don't have marijuana and uh, where it's not legal. They wanted to come here. First thing they wanted to do was go to a dispensary and have some marijuana because it's just, it's legal here. So they went straight from the airport, bought one of those big giant cookies, ate it, had a good time, ended up in our emergency room to our ICU because his breathing went whoosh. There, he, he was barely breathing. I'm not sure if we ended up putting him on a BiPAP. I know we didn't have to intubate him. Only because um, this cookie that he ate, he wasn't paying attention. This was a serving of, I think, 10 to 15. And he ate the whole thing. Especially from this patient's point of view, he, he wasn't used to that. I think we ended up, uh, he ended up getting discharged. It was okay. It was a lesson learned from him, but ooh, he spent his vacation at Spring Valley Hospital. Toxic effects, um, psychoactive. We're not gonna talk about toxic effects. One thing I'm gonna talk about um, is, Is this? No, not that. It's this cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. This happens when somebody smokes, eats. Actually, it mainly happens when you smoke it. At least what, what we've seen in our um, hospital, um, they smoke too much weed and they they're throwing up. They're throwing up. They're throwing up. It will not stop. We'll give them Zofran. We give them. What do we give Zofran every four hours or so? And it's just keep going and going. And what can we do? Give them some IV fluids, give you some Zofran every couple of hours and let this thing right out of your system, which should last what, four, six hours or so. Oh, there's the text that comes with that. So, THC, psychoactive, go have a good time. Just keep in mind, you may have to pee in a cup. You will be peeing in a cup in about a year. So uh, keep that, just remember that. Next is CBD. This is the non-psychoactive drug of marijuana, of uh, cannabis. It comes from the, on the other side of the marijuana, which is the, um, the hemp part of it the hemp side, the hemp family. Nothing makes them stop throwing up. I know, and there's nothing we can do with for them, but just give them that green little baggie that they fill up. And what we can do is give them a fresh one every now and then. Time, we need time, they need time. So CBD, CBD has been touted the miracle drug over the past few uh, past few years, about fifty years ago, we thought marijuana was great to get high. Ooh, it works. It it kind of works on some uh, makes somebody on pain, on headaches, on joint pains, and any other stuff. But nobody really looked at it until about fifty years ago, when then they isolated the CBD. And they thought, oh, shoot, this is where it is. The medicinal part of cannabis is right here. So what does it do? A lot. Chronic nerve pain, inflammation, muscle spasms, MS symptoms, reduces what is chemotherapy, induced nausea, vomiting, slow, may cause, may slow cancer growth, anxiety, terrorism, you not you terrorizing people, but you're terrified of stuff, something. Part comes with the anxiety, insomnia, 
acne, psoriasis, and also it can help with the uh, withdrawal from alcohol and other narcotics. There's actually hundreds more. I just grabbed a few. Ah, seizures. Oh, seizures is the, the biggest one. In fact, with the seizures, CBD, um, the FDA approved, there, the FDA approved this CBD for you um, in the US, this one, Epidiolex for um, use for seizures for uh, kids because uh, there's this, the Lennox Gastrot syndrome and Dravet syndrome is a rare type of seizure disorder for kids. And this thing works on them. So, and I'm, now they're also doing it for adult seizures. Um, they're, they're going through the testing, but this drug, the Epidiolex, is indicated for these, for these two types of seizures for kids. And the FDA says, yes, you can use it. Pharmacokinetics of it, yeah, we don't need to know that. It's sublingual, it goes in the mouth and it works. They're, they're put on a regimen based on the, I'm pretty sure the, uh, the neurologist controls the dosing of this for this patient. This is what um, Sasha was concerned about, drug testing. You will be peeing in the cup after you graduate because you're going to be working and it's part of the process, intake process. Um, the thing is, a lot of, who was that? I think it was Jeff who asked, said earlier that uh, there was um, a patient, and then a patient, a nurse at one of the hospitals, they made a med error. And, um, and you know, every time you make a med error in the hospital, you have to pee in a cup. It's, it's the process, they, it's just the way it is. That's how, it's the process for the hospital. So they pee in the cup to see if you have any drugs in the system. But in this case, the uh, nurse was prescribed THC for his chronic back pain. And this was disclosed before he even peed in the cup. But the, I think from what he said, uh, they ended up firing him because they found THC in the blood. So this is a gray area when it comes to drug testing and nurses, because we drink alcohol a lot. We, people, people can, be, can drink two gallons of vodka and show up to work and it's okay. But the thing is with the alcohol, when you test me for alcohol, it's gonna give me a number and it's gonna tell you how much alcohol level I have in my blood at that time. With the THC testing, with the mar marijuana testing, you can't, it's either in your system or it's not. Um, I think somebody mentioned earlier that they're working on a system where they can tell if you have, if you're impaired from marijuana, but we're not there yet. So um, I think this is a, an ongoing legal case from what was said earlier. So uh, stand by. So in this case, this was a nurse who was using it for, uh, for medicinal purposes for the chronic back pain. You guys know, we pull patients up, we hurt our shoulders, our neck, we use it, but then there's also a lot of nurses out there. We, or some, some us nurses, we use it uh, recreationally. I'm saying we, I don't use it recreationally. I just use it PRN, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, a lot of nurses out there, it's, they use it recreationally and it's okay. It's not a bad thing. If they're off, you can do whatever you want when you're off, as long as you're not impaired when you're at work. Cautions of the CBD, reliability. If you're gonna get on this thing, it needs to be tested. The, C the CBD approved by the FDA is heavily tested for accuracy and um, the dosing. That's one of the 
issues with this is it, the bottle might say, this gives me 10 milligrams of CBD per dose, but testing says, not really, it only gives you one milligram. So that is one of the issues with the CBD right now. It needs, they don't have that regulatory body yet to oversee their dosing. They do have the numbers they look for in the test. You're allowed a certain amount and if it's over the amount to see, then it's a positive test. Oh, do you know what this number is? I'm gonna do research on this. I have like three dispensaries within walking distance from me. I'll look it up. If you can tell me if you know. You can actually buy a home test. That's how I know that. Cause I had one for my kids, just more to keep them in line. Um, it has it on the little cup. You have to have a certain amount over um, and it's positive and so you're allowed a certain amount. So when they look for it, even whenever they do um, employment tests, it has to be over a certain amount for the I don't test. See you. Is that, is that you, Julie? It's very, it, yeah, it's me. <laughs> but it's a really small. I one. knew that. <laughs> Julie, yeah. THC. Aww. Not judging, but how did, why did I know that? <laughs> That's not why, <laughs> but um, yeah, saying. so it's just a small, small amount though that for the testing, it has to be under a real small amount. So it's still really sensitive, but yeah, there's a number. Okay. And also um, for patients who are going to get on the CBD um, for whatever reason, pain, arthritis, all this stuff that I listed earlier, there's more to that. You should see a physician who is well-versed or on uh, CBD. There's actual testing, there's actual dosing that they do instead of just going to the dispensary here and talking to Jeremy, hey, hey, the bud tender that can, they know what they're talking about too. They're, they're like expert on the, experts on these things. They can help you, but the physician, if it's something medically you want to do, you can. Highly recommended. Go through the physician. If it's something for medicinal purpose. Clean the cup. They can test your hair or blood test. Next is the, um, we're done with marijuana. Let's talk about other alternative therapy or alternative medications. Ancient roots. Many of these are the basis for development into regulated medicines. Here's a few examples. Willow bark is uh, the root for aspirin. Foxglove, digoxin, aloe for burns, medicine, and vinca leukemia. Never heard of foxglove or vinca before, but it's there. Oh, mandrake root for healing. Controls. One thing about this, uh, the supplement industry is there's no control. It's not monitored by the FDA and they're considered a dietary supplement. So there's no consistent dose. You can, different brands have different dosage. I take, I was telling, telling the group earlier, I take zinc um, regularly, vitamin, take multivitamin vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D. And I noticed that when I, I should pay attention next time, when I buy the zinc, that it's a different dosage than the last time I bought it. So it's, uh, I guess it depends on the manufacturer. So that's one issue that's with the um, supplement industry. Diabetics, diabetics get in trouble because they're trying to be healthy because of their diabetes. Here's a couple of um, supplements that gets them in trouble. Ginseng, juniper berries, garlic, fenugreek, coriander, dandelion roots. These all sound healthy. These sound, they come in a bottle, take my vitamins, I can go to the vitamin shop and buy all of these. But with this, the ginseng, uh, and actually all of these, they drop their blood sugar. So if you're diabetic, you want to get healthy and use all the health benefits of ginseng, garlic, all that stuff. Um, 
is make sure you, the patient, is checking their blood sugar frequently because it will tend to drop it. Next is the St. John's wort. It was something we talked about with psych drugs. It is used by some people to help with the mood, reduce anxiety. Some use it to help with premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual symptoms, menopause, cravings. Um, but these medications interact with an SSRI. I remember this was uh, one of the test questions. Interacts with digoxin, my heart medicine. I cannot have anything interact with my heart medicine. And also my pill. If I'm taking the pill, shoot, I may get pregnant because I'm trying to take this uh, supplement. So no to um, St. John's wort for these patients. Oh, and also theophylline and some cancer drugs and antivirus. So if you're in any of these, I would say if you're on any medications, do not take this St. John's wort. How about this? Drugs, not really drugs. I should have wrote uh, vitamin, mm, yeah, vitamins, supplements that causes bleeding. Fish oil is a big one. I take fish oil for good health. It gives me good cholesterol, but big but with this fish oil I take is, oh, other ones, is that it causes me to bleed more. Um, my example earlier was when, if I, whenever I go to the dentist's office, she's working in my mouth and she's just doing something small and then I start bleeding a lot. Um, we, and she, at least the first few times, she asked me if I'm on Plavix, aspirin, or any other blood thinner. And no, nope. And then we found out it's the fish oil that's causing the bleeding. So now she wants me to take, uh, stop taking the fish oil about a week or two before I go back to the dentist, which it didn't help. Why might a patient forget to tell the nurse about all supplements? So when you admit a patient in the hospital, the admission process is blah, blah, blah. Let me do your assessment, 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 assessment. Let me ask you these questions, standard questions, your vaccination stuff your medical history stuff, your next of kin, standard stuff, but, and also the medications you're taking at home so I can put it in a computer. So when we do your uh, medication reconciliation, it's all gonna match. I also need to know about your supplements because whatever medications we're gonna give you here, we might, you might be coming in for some heart issues and I need to put you on a digoxin or any other anything like that. So I need to know if you have something in your system that may interact with the medi medication we're gonna give you. Next, so we're done with alternative medicine. Now I'm gonna try and sell you something. So people work out, they buy vitamins, eat organic food, go to Whole Foods, get their $50 steak because it's healthy, it's grass fed, it's good, it's yummy. We eat healthy for longevity. And I said health and fitness industry is a $96 billion industry. The vitamin and supplement industry is a $46 billion industry per year. And because people are trying to live healthy and longer lives. But I'm going, with it. I'm going to sell you something that will almost guarantee that you will live longer. What is that? Whatever this thing is, millions of people have taken it. It lives up to the hype. I'm telling you, this thing will extend your life. It's going to make you feel good and live a long, happy life. It's been approved by American, American Medical Association, American Nurses Association. The best part, it's free. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about. For those who don't, I'm talking about vaccines. I thought that was a good segue to the vaccines. Immunization, what is it? 
the process of artificially giving me something so my body reacts to it. So when I get the real germs, disease in my body, my body attacks it. That was the old school way. Give me this MMR, give me this uh, whatever disease is and my body's gonna react to it. Things change a little bit, but the goal is for our immune system to be ready for whatever this infection is, this uh, disease is. The action is to stimulate production of antibodies, provide preform antibodies to facilitate immune reduction. And um, we want our body to react to this thing, foreign germ in our body. Types of immunity. Active immunity, the body recognizes a foreign protein and begins producing antibodies to react to it. Passive immunity is, occurs when performed preformed antibodies are injected into the system and react with a specific antigen. Indications for the vaccine, so when I don't get sick, so we don't get sick. That's spirit of fairness right forward. Vaccines are taught to provide lifelong immunity, but then with the uh, some other ones, we need the booster shot. We have Hep A. Uh, I think I forgot. I can't think of two part series. No, I just had a Hep A booster here. Maybe it was B not too long ago because they checked and my level was off. Contraindication: allergies is definitely a big one. Uh, pregnancy. Um, immune deficiency, I talked about it earlier. If you cannot have, oh, Morgan got it right. Sorry, I wasn't looking down. If I, um, if I, if I am immunocompromised, we are not giving my patient a live vaccine. Allergies, and look at this fourth one: patients receiving immune glo globin or who have received received blood or blood products within the last three months. So. You just receive a foreign blood product in your system and your system is still adjusting to that. Give it some time before you take a vaccine, before we introduce another type of germ, different type of germ in your body. It sounds nasty, germ, but that's what it is. It's a germ, it's a bacteria that we're introducing to our body so it will attack it. Adverse effects, fever, rash, malaise, uh, drowsiness, anore I don't know about anorexia, vomiting, irritability, pain, redness. This is a big one. Pain, redness, and swelling at the injection site. Syncope, saw so a handful of these at the, uh, when we were giving the COVID vaccines at UNLV. I was uh, telling patients who were coming in for their first shot that Here's your first shot, thank you, have a good day. But for the second shot, preload with a Tylenol before you come here. It worked, at least for me, it worked. It worked for a lot of the people I know. Because one of the issues with it was the shoulder thing. There's, there's three different types of vaccines. Oh, the vaccine types, eh. So because of the vaccines, we have some diseases that's been erased, not completely erased, eradicated from the face of the earth. According to CDC, these diseases used to be prevalent in the US, but now they're non, almost non-existent anymore, is it existent anymore. Smallpox, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, at least here in the U.S., I have not seen anybody outside of, uh, I think it was McConnell that was reminded, he reminded me earlier, McConnell who had uh, polio. But measles, mumps, rubella, I haven't heard or seen anybody with that. But in, outside of the U.S., it's still prevalent. Childhood vaccinations. If you have kids, hmm, I think I was talking to maybe Marissa with this last 
last week and uh she knows exactly the the shots that her kids uh, got when they were one year old up to, when they were newborn three months six months nine months to one year old so dpt rotavirus poliovirus meningitis hemophilus hepatitis a and b are all given under one year old and when your kid gets to after one year old, then they get the measles, the MMR and varicella. Why is that? Because the MMR and varicella are live vaccines and we don't wanna introduce these live vaccines to our kids yet. Types of vaccines. There's, whoa. Oh, what happened? I think that. All right. It just died. Technical difficulties. Mm. There. Da, 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 da. Let me take you down here. Maybe I need to update it. My PowerPoint. There we go. Here we go. Types of vaccines, there's a handful of them, but we're going to focus on the top three inactivated vaccines, live attenuated vaccines, and mRNA vaccines. The other ones, yeah, it's there, but we don't need to uh, focus on it. Inactivated vaccines uses the dead version of the germ that causes the disease. And so there's a couple hepatitis A flu, polio, rabies. They're not as strong as the live vaccines because they're dead. So with these ones, we may or may not need a booster shot. It's like um, myself, I told you I needed a hepatitis A booster shot. Next, the live attenuated vaccines. Because these vaccines are similar to the natural infection, they help prevent, they create a strong and lasting immune response. Just one or two doses of the live vaccines, and it can give you a lifetime protection against the germ and the disease it causes. But with the live vaccines, it has some limitations. They contain, because they contain a small amount of the weakened live virus, some people should not take them, like our immunosuppressed patients, our cancer patients, um, so or people that had organ uh, transplant. And they also need to be kept cool so they don't travel well. So in countries that refrigerator refrigeration is limited, these may not fly with them. Next. MRNA vaccines. This is, we're not introducing a dead germ into your body or a live germ. This is a, um, we're introducing a, a something in your body that will, the protein in your body that will give your body instructions to fight this bacteria when it comes. So how it works is it gets into your body, it gets into your cell, it produces the, um, the, uh, the antibodies to fight this COVID or what COVID that's coming into my body. And after it gives my body instructions how to fight this COVID, it falls off, it dies. Uh, so um, that's why during the testing process, the side effect of this medication 
can be seen within the first couple of weeks, because, and then that's it. Because after a couple of weeks, this mRNA thing is no longer in your body. It's just psh, gone. So unlike the, this is made using new technology. And for the record, this technology was started in the 1970s. And, um, and over time, in the eight, it needed a lot of parts. In the 80s, they found a part to work with it. Wow, it was great. In the 90s, they found another part. In the 2000s, they found another part. And a few years ago, they found a final part to finally make this thing. And it did. So what it is, is it's this, um, this mRNA vaccine. It's done. It's, it's, it's packaged. So the next disease or... Uh, that, or I don't want to say the next COVID that comes up, it could be the uh, Alex virus. All they're going to do is take the Alex virus, put it in here, and boom, it's done. It's ready to go. And, and we're there. We have the technology now to do it. In fact, what they're using it now is for... Um, they're working, they're trying to use this thing. They're working on a flu shot for this. But the flu shot they're working on is um, a one and done flu shot. One flu shot for the rest of your life. If you're a healthcare worker, um, you know, we get flu shots every year. It changes, the formula changes. So with this, they're cooking it that we get one flu shot, and we're done for the rest of our lives. How does it work? I talked about it already. It doesn't really introduce anything into our body. It just gives us the part that our cells are ready to fight this bacteria without having to introduce the actual bacteria into our system. Another issue is that uh, it, it messes with my DNA. It doesn't, it doesn't even go inside your DNA, your cell. It's strictly on the outside. Main difference between ah. facts about this mRNA vaccines and what is this? They cannot give someone COVID. I don't know what I meant by that. So they cannot, oh. I know what I meant by that. Since we're not introducing the COVID to me when we give the shot, I'm not going to give it to another patient. It's like, it's like when the flu, a flu, uh, the flu vaccine, patient gets the flu vaccine and then they get the flu and then give the flu to somebody else. So that doesn't happen because we do not introduce the COVID-19 to the patient. Do not use the live virus. They do not affect or interact with our DNA in any way. 14% uh, are uh, vaccinated worldwide. Less than 50% are vaccinated in the US. Pandemic of the uh, unvaccinated. Our uh, hospitals are filling up and vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, please tell your people to get vaccinated. That's it. So another thing with this COVID vaccine is the um, um, some people are hesitant to take this, but in case, just a reminder, when we first got the vaccine, it was always touted as 95 to 98% effective. Nobody ever said, you will be 100% immune to the disease. But if you take it, you're, you are less likely to get severe symptoms and less likely to die from it, which is what statistics are showing now that 99% of the people dying or getting sick from it or being hospitalized from it are uh, from the unvaccinated people. It was also never touted as the treatment for the uh, COVID, not the treatment. COVID vaccines, ah, typical talking points. Um, uh, let's go back. When we first discovered, discovered COVID last year, we tried different things. The, they said lockdown. So we locked down for a couple of months, I believe. 
And that did not work out. People lost their jobs, their livelihood, everything else. And when that didn't work out, mask and social distancing was in place. 50%, 25% in uh, facilities, I mean, restaurants and places. That did not work. So I think around uh, September, October-ish, everybody was holding their breath for the vaccine. Then the, pre the president back then said he was working with the FDA and pharmaceutical companies for Operation Warp Speed to cut the red tape on getting this vaccine out. So it started rolling out in December and it's ready to go. I got the, one of the first batches and I'm still okay. Professor, what are some of the side effects? Because I don't, I don't see them further down. Uh, with most of the other topics, we've seen some side effects. So what are some of the side effects for the COVID vaccine? Side effects. Um, from the shot, um, sh the, sh the shot, what, are you, what am I trying to say here? From the, from the shot site, um, soreness, um, the other ones are, there was this one, I thought I had it here. There was about 500 cases where this, the patients had heart issues because of this medication. So um, that was another uh, side effect. I forgot what the heart condition was. I thought I had it here. It's probably in one of my texts here, but uh, 500 cases or more. Um, under a thousand for um, for the vaccine. And Bell's palsy. Uh, Bell's palsy was also one of the side effects that some people suffered from. Okay. Yeah. So I don't have any data on the Bell's palsy one. I just have um, the the I think it was endocarditis, if I remember it right. About five hundred patients. They died. They range from uh, 40 years old or under. So that is one of the um, side effects I can think of. And the Bell's palsy, that's something I've heard before, but I never, I don't have any data on it. My husband had the heart issues. His heartbeat went down into the 40s uh, for several days. He ended up in the emergency room the first night. Oh, what did they say it was? They couldn't pinpoint it. They knew that he took the vaccine and they basically said that that's what it was, but they didn't know that um, bradycardia was also a side effect. They thought it was just tachycardia, but now they found out that it's both. So yeah, totally affects the heart. So bradycardia, this yeah. was how long after um, he got the vaccine? Uh, I want to say within the first 72 hours, well, within like the first 48 hours, okay. but it, it continued on for uh, a couple of weeks on and off and his heartbeat was all over the place and his heart rate is steady like a horse. So it really, it's weird. Okay. So yeah, that's one of the uh, things with this. If somebody's going to experience uh, side effects, it's going to be within the first couple of weeks while the, uh, this MRNA is still in the system. After that, it's gone. And as far as those uh, people with endocarditis, don't call me on endocarditis, but I'm pretty sure it's endocarditis with the 500 patients that died from it. But uh, from mathematical point of view, 500 patients over 160 million uh, doses, doses mm, I think my, uh, that's about 0.0002%. So um, from statistics point of view. Uh, so these are good, what did I say here? Do your research. If you're going to do some research, make sure it's uh, uh, peer reviewed because um, before a study is published, it has to be nitpicked by every, every, by a lot of the experts where they look at the, um, um, the patient population, your location, uh, age group population, is your neighbor the Pfizer Pfizer, the Pfizer guy, do you have stocks in Pfizer? If any of these create a red flag, then it's not good for publication. My 
neighbor Jim, who is a, a personal trainer, is not a good source of information. This, this patient, I was, so when I was looking this up, I found this guy. I was watching the news. I found this guy. Uh, you may know this guy because he's a local person. Uh, he was in the news. They, they were interviewing his wife. And um, it's kind of sad that uh, they were, um, this is what he was texting the wife. They were both unvaccinated. The wife and the kids are now vaccinated. This is uh, before he got intubated. He was texting the wife, I should have gotten the damn vaccine. And uh, go to Fox 5 and look at this video. It's, I don't know, it's gonna make you cry because they were doing CPR on him while the fiance was there. And, but after they did CPR, he didn't make it. Since they're not married, the doctor had to talk to the guy's parents and tell them that he didn't make it. So I don't know this guy. I just know he's one of us. He's a lot, I guess he's well known if you're, uh, if you work at the M Casino, it looks like he's been there a while. So they have a GoFundMe. If you have, if I know you guys are college student, if you have some spare change, add to that. Some of us did, it's kind of help because he was the primary breadwinner. For the, um, for the family. Lastly, interactions with the vaccines, uh, immunosuppressive drugs. And I think I talked about this already, childhood vaccinations. What you need to remember is the last two, MMR can only be given after a year, at the year mark, at the earliest. Because remember, we don't want to introduce these uh, live vaccines to the kids yet. Oh, that's it. That's all I got. The, the study guide is updated. If there's anything on there that you don't understand, ask me, because sometimes when I type something on there, I use my own abbreviation that makes sense to me. If it doesn't make sense to you, let me know. And if there's any questions on there, uh, highly text me or uh, call me because I'm still having issues with the, uh, the Canvas email. I don't see it until I log into my computer. Questions, comments? If not, I will see some of you guys Thursday and Friday. Is that it? That's not all we got. See you Friday. Enjoy your day off. Good day off before finals week. And that's it.